This morning's lesson is a lesson that I, I hope will be very helpful for you. It's one of those lessons that you almost are shocked when Jesus Christ enters into a situation. A friend of mine made a comment one day. He said he had a t-shirt in the States that says he's coming back. And boy, is he angry. And the picture I always have in my mind is the question, how would Jesus be if he was angry? How would he be when he was annoyed? I think when I look at the benevolent side of Christ, I see a phenomenal person, a tremendously compassionate man, an individual with such deep love that not even giving his life would stop him from loving even though love was not extended to him. I want to ask you a question today. If you had one month to live, how would you look at your life? How would you relook at certain things, at certain priorities in your life that you would want to change, that you would want to alter than where you are at the moment? I want to tell you something. There's great value in being ill. There's great value in being sick. And the reason for that is that it gives three things for you to do. It basically gives you a time to reflect. If you ask me, Derek, what advice would you give me? And I may be not at a point that of great spirituality, you might say, and neither am I. I will tell you that there are three things that I would help you and pray that God brings to center stage in your life. The first thing is to give you time to reflect, time to think long and hard, to slow down and to pause and to almost cloud out your diary and say, I cannot do anything now because I need to think. I need time of deep reflection. The second one I would pray for you is that you would clarify your mind. In other words, that you would really and truly clear your mind from all the stuff and the clutter that sometimes just invades your mind. In fact, one day I was sitting with a friend and we were having coffee. And it was one of those holy moments that we just spoke such deep spiritual things about his life and my life. And we were reflecting about stuff and he says, and while we were talking his phone rang. And he's a busy man. And he said to me, man alive, I, I hate this thing. He says, at times I, I really and truly want just silence. It invades my privacy. And there are times that we need to reflect and we need to clarify our minds. We need to stop these things from invading. And the third thing I would encourage you to do is to create a sense of urgency about certain aspects of your life. Let me ask you a question. If you knew, if you knew that you had one month to live, what are the things that you have left dangling, things that you've left undone for such a long time? What would you bring into sharp focus and alter in your life? You see, Jesus Christ was an amazing orator, but he walked a sermon that sometimes just profoundly stuns you when you read the text. You almost imagine, I wonder how I would have reacted had I been there. The text that we just read was Jesus Christ going into the temple, and I would imagine that he was a very strong man, history would indicate. To carry that cross, to be able to carry it and to stand through the kind of punishment that he did, he must have been an exceptionally strong, powerful man. Many people never even survived the flogging and they would die by the sheer trauma to the physical body. So I would imagine that Jesus was a strong man. But I would imagine that if Jesus Christ would walk in and he would start overturning tables, and he'd start to walk into the temple area and say, enough. And he would throw it over and overturn it. I wonder what that picture would look like. I understand the world of violence. I lived in there many years ago. And I shudder sometimes when I think of those mental pictures 
of the kind of thing of a man that is on a righteous mission would go around and overturn things. In verse 12 of the text that we read, it reads, I want you to read with me again if you've got your Bible open. It says, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. I would imagine on that moment that nobody would have stopped him. Number one, it would have been completely out of the nature of the worship environment. But Jesus went in and he gets rid of whatever is, is in his way. I would imagine when the children was watching all of this, they must have thought, this is awesome, this is cool, this is fantastic. Wow, look at this guy. I would imagine children feel like that sometimes, just overturning things and messing things up. And they found it phenomenal. But I want you to watch the reaction of those who were more on the older side of us kind of guys, how it violated their sense of decency. He's angry. It's out of character. And I would imagine that they probably would not even have spared a moment to ask the question, I wonder why this guy is so angry. But Jesus was angry. But he saw worshippers profiteering from the poor. They were turning Roman currency into Jewish currency so that they could worship. It wasn't fair exchange. They were profiteering. They were trying to enhance themselves rather to enable, encourage, enhance the people around them. They were rather trying to enhance and embellish the worship to make it a greater opportunity to suck more money in. And that was, it was, all, that was what it was all about. For them it was not about God. It might have started out as that. But soon the heart is captured by the prophet motive. And you might ask, but what has that got to do with me? Oh, it's got everything to do with you and me. God would have us look at our lives. If Jesus Christ had one month to live, would he sit aimlessly on his couch at home and flip through his remote control and watch all the channels on television that he's never watched before? Would he grab his credit card and start shopping and saying, hang on a minute, I'll be dying in 30, in 30 days' time. My insurance will cover all my lavish expenditure. Not a problem. I'll buy a television for this one. I'll buy this for that one. And, all that kind of, and I'll max out my credit card. Would he go to the beach or watch a rugby or soccer game? I think he might watch the Stormers, but the picture is, is that he probably would ask the question, what is most important thing? Would he look at his bank account and say, let me just see how much profit I've made, how well I am financially at the moment, and how great I am at the moment. How well have I done financially? Jesus Christ walks into your and my life today, and he flips our religious tables and he says, I want you to look long and I want you to look hard at your heart. I want you to look at your heart and ask those hard questions. What is this all about? What is this about? I ask the question every single day of my life and I'll tell you why I do. Because it keeps me honest. It keeps me full of integrity before a holy God and it helps me understand why I do and why I live for what I do. You might want to ask the question this morning. Why am I at service this morning? Now for some of us it might be an unfair question because we live for, <coughs> for being with God's people every day. Can I ask you a few questions? Where was your mind during the Lord's Supper this morning? While you were listening to the Lord's Supper, can you understand and listen to what Johann said? Can you remember the text that he quoted from? Can you remember the significance he drew from his grandmother's death and to the resurrection of, his, of, his, of, of Jesus Christ and what that means and the correlation that comforts him and his family at a difficult time as this? What do you give on the Lord's day? Is it an afterthought? And I felt convicted in my heart because I had a different set of pants on yesterday and inside my back pocket there is money and I didn't have it and I felt convicted in my heart. But then I remembered I had money in my, in my other fold and I will definitely put that in before I leave worship this morning. Yes, Derek. Is it at the forefront of your mind or is it an afterthought? Yes, Derek. It applies to you. 
Are you interested more in the length of the sermon rather than evaluating the content of the sermon and whether it applies to me and to my heart? Do you ask those half God questions and say, if I look at the life of Jesus Christ and the life that he desires for me and that God calls me to, do I live up to that or do I dismally disappoint him when nobody's looking? Can the world see Jesus in me? Or does the world recognize religious hypocrisy at its worst when it sees me in action in my working environment? When I should be displaying humility and love and compassion and leadership that is godly and counterintuitive and completely countercultural, do I go with the flow? And I behave so ungodly that the world, when they look at me and say, I do not want to be like you. Heinrich Heine. A German atheist made the comment that convicted my soul one day. He made a comment, he says, I do not believe in your God. But he said, let me watch your life and maybe, and maybe I will believe in your Redeemer. You see, will people see Jesus in me? In the way that I reach into my pocket, in the way that I hold the hand of the poor and the lame and the sick and the brokenhearted and help them understand that Jesus loves them. Or is it a moment for me to look down on them and say, all you can do is expect the wrath of God? Solomon wrote many years ago, he said, the integrity of the upright guides him, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Many years ago, I had the pleasure of visiting with a wonderful friend of mine. She's a clinical psychologist in Johannesburg, and we were just talking about a few of the things that she deals with in her life, and she had serious challenges with regards to her faith. And while I was sitting with Sophia, I said to her, Sophia, you are living in duplicity at the moment. You are straddling the fence because you are not even quite sure about God. And she said to me, Derek, it's hard for me when I deal with the clinical issues of people and still to believe that there's a righteous God. And I said, but there is a righteous God that desires for them to be as close and to be like him, and that should shed your duplicity. She started crying and she said, Derek, thank God I spoke to you today. Duplicity, brethren, is double sinnigheid. Is the idea that you can verspultierig wees en draai van een ding na die ander. Die Heere verwacht van ons om doelgericht en nou gesit te wees in dit wat die waarheid is and that which is truth and that which is honorable. And so God says, I want you to have integrity. I want you to be undivided in your loyalty toward me. I want you to be so focused on that which is righteous that you will even give your life for that. And Jesus Christ would say to me, Derek, deal with your hypocrisy. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 9 says, The man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. This is probably one of the most scariest things that I've ever read in my life. The other day, a friend of mine, we were sitting down and we were talking and I couldn't see him and he phoned me and he said, Derek, can I pray for you? I said, absolutely you can. And he said to me, Derek, what is the song that you love more than anything else? I said to him, there's a song that says, I've been redeemed. And the reason for that song is so important is that I pray to God that no one founds out the crooked paths that I've walked. And I'm sure you will say, I don't mind. Well, I think that's exactly the same with folk that came to worship that day. I want you to watch the text in verse 13. Jesus Christ says, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and teachers of the law saw wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the Son of God, they were indignant. How are we when people break the law of God and they're hurting themselves? Do you silently say, I cannot wait to see your destruction? Or do you, in your heart, become so sad and say, Lord, just help me. Give me the opportunity to reach into their lives, Father, and to turn them where they're at. You and I know that there's an unwritten, not unwritten, it is written in God's law, where he says, God is not mocked. He said, whatever a man sows, he will reap. And so we know 
that Jesus Christ turns around and he looks at these people and I want you to know the following, that the blind and the lame were not allowed in the temple because they were imperfect. They were enabling themselves. Jesus Christ was enabling the lame and the poor to worship a holy God. He turns around and he says, aren't you happy for this? Aren't you happy for this? But the interesting thing is that they don't acknowledge it. The children have got to cry out about these things. Kids recognize these things. It's profound. Our question, are we concerned with the blind, with the lame, the poor, the homeless, the elderly and those who find it, don't find it easy to worship God? Are we really the kind of people that are folk that would be compassionate and would phone folk when they're not here and say, hey, we missed you. And when folks say, you're phoning to check up where I was on Sunday, say, no, I genuinely wanted to know whether there is anything that I could do for you. That's the reason we phone. Here's an observation. Sometimes it's sad. But when we've been with the, with the Lord for a longer time, we become more indignant, least understanding and compassionate. Sometimes, and I must tell you this, and this is scary, I've heard the most ugliest cutting, cutting comments and harshest comments when folk have strayed from God, from folk who has been in the, in the church long, rather than folk who will walk to them and say, I'm going to walk with you. Spiritual mistakes should not, be ma- keep, should not keep us out of the worship assembly. When you and I have dishonored God, don't try to think that I'm going to stay away from worship because I'm unworthy. I want to just settle it all for you now. You are not worthy and neither are we that are here. But our worthiness are found in the cross of Christ. The fact that this God has died on on the cross of Calvary and when you ask him, Jesus, how much do you love me? He said, I love you this much. And then when he stands there and they say, why don't you get them to pull you from that cross? He says, I can't do it. I'll go all the way for you. That's how much he loves you. And your worthiness is outside of you and it's to be found in the blood of Christ, not in your own righteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9 would say to you, if you will acknowledge your sins, confess your sins, be faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. This Jesus who we love. This Jesus Christ who's God on the cross. And we studied that this morning in our Sunday morning study. I will send you the notes this week. I want you to read it. You see, brethren, in my heart of hearts, I was an atheist at one time. Because you don't try to sell me a religion that I cannot understand. And boy, when I believed in Jesus Christ, I fell on my knees and I said, Lord, forgive me my unbelief. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, I wish I could quote this verbatim. He says, but at the right time Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, he makes another comment. He says, at the right time he died for those who are unworthy and those who were enemies of the cross at the right time. And so Jesus Christ can be verifiable in history. His authenticity of coming for you and I can be assessed and found and your faith is not built on a whim or just saying, well, I glue in a God, but he's there and he's living for me. There is reasons for loving God and they are found in this word of God and that is why we give our life for him. We don't give our life for a whim, even though it's a good whim. Perhaps this is a good place for you to and I to look and our compassionate quotient. And that's asking you, how much compassion do you have for people? How much compassion do you have for those who are broken? How much compassion have you got when people are weak? When people say, it is hard for me, Derek, to worship God. You see, brethren, we need to do a few things. The first thing I would encourage you is enter into intense and frequent prayer. I'm not talking about that prayer when you're driving down and say, oh Lord, please save me from the taxis this morning. If you know what I mean. Or when you're standing at the train or bus station and say, ah, hier is a brief that loop tijd kom vandag, want ek moet by die werk wees, ek het so baie werk. No, 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 not that. We all pray those prayers. I'm talking about those prayers when you close the door and you find when the kids walk in there and they say, sorry dad, 
but where you're on your hands and knees before a holy God. And while you're talking to your God in your mind, your wife comes next door to you, holds you on your arm, and then you pray out loud so that she can hear what you say to a holy God. I'm talking about those kind of prayers that is transparent before God. Something that the wife can listen to, that your children can listen to. Prayers like the battery in your car. If you ask me, Derek, I'm struggling in my walk with God, I can guarantee you that your prayer life is exactly in relation to that, probably not as good as it could be. You see, your battery will help you. And your prayer will help you to think like God does. It will help you to help the weak when you see other people struggling. Oh, you won't stand in judgment. You will stand and say, let me help you. When it comes to the poor, you won't say, ach, they're just a nuisance. But you will turn around and you will take out of what you've got and say, I cannot give you money because I do fear that you might use it for some addictive substance. But I can give you a fruit. I can give you a sandwich. I can give you leftover food that I've had, a doggy bag that I've got from a restaurant. Have this and enjoy this. I give it with all my heart. Carrying another's burdens. Fulfilling the law of Christ. Secondly, humility increases our compassion. And maybe sometimes we are just so full of pride because we've come so far with the Lord and God has blessed our life that it is so hard for us to see when people are struggling. You see, many times when you and I become indignant, we end up cheating God's worshippers. We become judgmental. We attack even Jesus' purpose. And we exclude the lame and the poor. You see, pride never wants to come alongside others to help. Pride always wants to look down on others. Pride never wants to celebrate Jesus. Pride always wants to be superior. You know what I always say, brethren? Some of us have an inferior complexion that we must try and make ourselves look good. You know what? Get over it. Christ has given you your worth. And being a child of God is much worse worth than anything else in the world. No money can make you richer. Pride, a haughty spirit, is one of the seven things that God hates, brethren. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And if anything, I want to encourage you to look at that in your life. Thirdly, if you have one month to live, will you change your attitude toward children? In verse 16, Jesus Christ says, Do you hear what these children are saying? And they asked him, Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? I want you to note something, brethren. Have you ever watched how children sing? Oh, I tell you, I love it. I love it. I've still got a tape of Victoria, and they had a little CD cut at the Bible school. And you listen to Victoria and a lot of her little mates, David and and they were singing a song, and they cut a CD, by the way. It is so beautiful to listen to those innocent voices. Children are rejoicing. Listen to Jesus in so many different settings. He says, let the children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Listen to Jesus when he says, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom. Someone said to me many years ago, I was an elderly person in Namibia, and I was sitting down and the person said to me, if you want to know the character of someone, watch the way he treats children. It shocked me. But you know what? I found that to be true. I have found that whenever I want to know what's in the heart of a person, I watch the child's reaction, how they react to them. And it's interesting to find that maybe it won't show out initially, but it certainly will come through later. An elderly gentleman on a farm in Namibia, in Gokhas, he said to me one day, if you want to know what a person's nature is, look at a dog. Hey, Just watch a dog. I had a little, I'm, I'm going to tell you this story, it's actually a shocking story. I had a little brachy called Polonius. He was just a short, Man, he was a pavement special of note. He had such brown spots. I'm not quite sure if he was a small Alsatian or if he was a whatever, you know. 
but he was the most gorgeous animal you can imagine, escape artist from out of this world. Nothing could keep this cat in the thing, and he loved the ladies. <coughs> so whenever I looked for Polonius, he was gone. And I'd say to Sue, we must check where this clown gets out. And he would escape from wherever he could, but the most interesting of him was I watched him around people. And there's certain people that he would go to and he would just love them. He would go and rub himself against them. But the problem is I always warn people, I says, you know what, he doesn't always just rub into the grass. He rubs into what's in the grass. So he often had a bit of a funky smell to him. But this is what Polonius did one day which really drew my attention. He went up to a certain a friend of ours, a friend of ours, and he just lifted his leg and caught a leak on his leg. I looked at this dog and I was... I said, oh Lord, I hope he doesn't figure it out. Anyway, I, I said to him, Polonius! And I pulled him here and I said to him, stay here. Man, as time went on, two minutes later, and he just gives him a bit of a flash, you know. I couldn't believe it. And this guy eventually noticed. He says, man, what's the deal with your dog? I says to him, ah, man, it's like he's probably just watering you, hoping you'd grow bigger one day. So he says to me, this dog, well, he was a very nice guy. And I must be honest, I got worried about it. And eventually I said to Sue, have you watched this dog's reaction toward this man? It's the only guy that he intensely disliked. Well, Many years later, we discovered that there was a friend of ours that he had hurt. And she kept quiet about these things. We never knew that. And eventually I said to Sue that sometimes folk keep their duplicity so well hidden that sometimes only a child or a dog can see it. But I want to say this to you. I want you to think highly of children. Can I tell you what my highlight is? Our oh, Sunday morning worship is when I get hugs from the children. There is nothing in the world that is so beautiful just to get a hug from them. And they come and they tell me about their school week. I hear the most amazing stories. Let me tell you one of the stories. One of the stories was that kids were taking toilet paper, wet toilet paper, throwing it up against the wall. One kid took toilet paper and lit the fire and he almost burnt the toilet down. I love those stories. And I would imagine Jesus must have been enthralled with his stories. That's why he says, please don't keep them away from me. Because to those belong the kingdom of heaven. You know, we need to treat them well, not look down on them. And sometimes we need to listen to them while they are singing, while they're praising the Messiah. God wants us to be childlike, not childish. Childlikeness is praising God with an innocent faith. Childishness, childishness is refusing to change, is to think that we've got it all sorted out, that I don't need to change. Childlikeness says, Lord, I'm in your hand and I know that you want me to change and you want better from me. We become more like them. We'd be found praising God even in the midst when other people are listening and says, Derek, you really suck at singing. And you can say, I don't care, but I love singing about God. Finally, this is just a short one. We would change our faith potential. Now maybe today you are sitting here and saying, you know, Derek, I hear all of those things. I hear all of those things that you feel that I must trust God and I must be like a child. But I want to stop here and tell you quickly. Listen to what Jesus says. Early in the morning as he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the fruit with, uh, tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? And they asked, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith, listen to this, and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. Listen to this. If you believe, 
you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. We have more tried to dissect the meaning of Jesus Christ trying to cause this thing to wither. But it's got everything to do with human potentiality, which Jesus, I want to safely say, believes more in you than you yourself. Jesus Christ believes more in you. But Jesus Christ says, there's one thing that I want to say to you. I want you to ask me. In the book of Luke chapter 6, when Jesus Christ teaches them to pray, he teaches about the much more God. And then he says, how is it that an evil man, when his son asks him for bread, he, won't, he will give him a rock or a snake? How much more your Father in heaven will give you when you ask? I've got to tell you, you need to start asking God. And maybe today you have achieved so much. And you say, Derek, are you saying to me that I can achieve more? I want to say to you, yes, you can. Because God believes more in you than you yourself. Greater faith to work, to be productive, to have even greater influence, to have a greater effect on our society, to bring more people to Christ. And so this morning I want to ask you, what are the mountains that you're facing? Are they financial? Are they spiritual? Are they family? Are they aging problems? Are they health issues? Jesus is saying to you, pray and apply your faith to these mountains. He says, because whatever you ask of me, I will give you. Why? Because you are his child. I sometimes I get nervous and Susie asked me a simple question. What can I get you for your birthday? Do you know what I said to my wife? I need nothing. I've got everything that I need. And I can tell you that before God. That is not pseudo-spirituality. I've got everything that I need. You know what she bought me? She bought me some speakers. Just when we may be having a seminar somewhere, that we can use it. We don't have to borrow them from friends or sometimes forget them. I said, that's a good idea. You need to reach the point where being a child of God doesn't require things to prop you up. And so this morning, maybe your greatest challenge is to have that relationship with God. Maybe your greatest need today is for Him to lift you up from where you are. I want to tell you that Jesus Christ is the much more God and we need to pray for Him. I want to close this morning's lesson with a prayer. Hadia is leaving for Botswana. He's a great young man. Hadia, I'm not going to ask you to stand, but does everybody know you, Hadia? Probably not. Don't you want to just stand and, and briefly just sort of turn, like a catwalk thing? Hadia is probably one of the most humble young men around. And Sorry, I'm not forcing him to be prideful, but it's not prideful. It's just... Hardy leaves for Botswana on Tuesday. You see, in our country at the moment, he can't fly in his own country where he was born. And I can tell you there's nothing that angers me more. But I believe in a God that is in control of this entire universe, including those things, because I know what they feel like. But I want to say this to you, Hardy. You're going to Botswana on Tuesday. But you go with one knowledge that you're going there with God that lives within you. We will pray for you. We will ask God to guide you together. We ask him to hold your hand. We ask him to increase your flight hours and we ask him to keep you safe because we want you back. Because we love you. Let's pray together for him. Our Father in heaven, today we respond to a prayer request for Hadia that leaves for Botswana. Father, it's an environment where we pray that you will watch over him because there he can increase his flight hours, Father God, to come back to this country which is his. We pray that you will bless him, that you will hold him in the hollow of your hand, that you will hold the steering wheel of that aeroplane as he takes off, but also as he lands, Father. Will you bless him, Father, and may your angels always guard his life. 
May you make his paths prosperous, Father God, because he walks with you. May you make him upright, Father God, to understand that he's a child of a king. And no matter where he is, Father God, he walks inside of a covenant that is divinely and irrevocably pronounced over his life. Father, we have family here that are struggling and frustrated because the economy is tough. Will you bring up in them, Father, the resilience to never give in but become creative as to how to overcome the challenges? And we pray for wisdom for them, Father. Will you bless us this day, Father? And we thank you for this holy moment in Jesus' name. Let's stand together and sing a song of closing, and then we'll have our closing prayer. Let's stand together. song of peace from the torrent of the will bring release. When the and a blessing song, showers of great blessing from my heart will flow. Sing to me, O heaven, for the glory of its heart Sing to me when the shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me when the secrets of the soul. Sing to me when the and the shadows of the rising when we go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long. Sing to me, O oh, heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me, O oh, heaven, make me find me dream of His souls, the glory of His life is living. Sing to me when the shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me, O oh, heaven, sing the songs of old. So you saw my bed. Heilige Vader in die Himmel, o Vader, ons kom met dankbaarheid in ons hart en met nederigheid van gemoed. Kom ons voor die troon van genade in hierdie oog en toe, Vader, en ons breng hierdie gebed naar die beste van ons vermoe. Himmelse Vader, ons dankie vir hierdie wonderlijke dag, hierdie eerste dag van die week wat ons kan op sy sit. Vader, ons waar ons die dinge boor die son kan bedink. O Vader, ons dankie vir die boore van jy self, wat hier die mond van Derek tot ons gekom het in hierdie dag. Vader, ons bid dat ons daar die woorde deel van ons leven sal maak en dat ons ook sal uitdra en uitleef in die verloore gaan en wereld daar buiten. Jongens, vader, ons dankie vir die voorraag het wat ons hierdie gebed tot u kan bring. Vader, ons dankie dat dier u woord dat ons weet dat u hand nie te kort is om ons te help nie en dat u oor nie te zwaar is om ons te hoor nie. Vader, ons dankie dat ons weet dat u gebede verhoor. Vader, ons bid dat u vir ons daar die buisheid sal geer dat ons die antwoorde altyd sal ontvaar. Jongens, vader, ons dankie vir hierdie gemeente hier in Belville, vir die leiers wat ons voortgaan in hierdie, in hierdie gemeente, dat jy elkeen van ons in die besonder so sien in hierdie dag, vir die liefde in die hart gehad het, om saam die heilig is in hierdie dag te vergader. Vader, ons bid vir al die predikers van, van gerechtigheid, al die gemeentes recht oor die wereld, hulle sal sien, so dat jy koninkryk hier op aarde vir jylike mag word. Vader, ons bid ons ook so dat jy sal saam ons wees in hierdie rest van hierdie dag. Vader, in die besonder denk ons aan diegene wat smag om saam met ons hier te kan wees, wat weens in omstandig nie kan wees nie. Ek ken elke in so omstandig hier, vader, die siek is. Vader, die ouwe is vandaag, die wat in stilte en pijn verkeer, en ons bid dat die elke van ons en van hulle in die besonder in die dag sal sien. Gaan dan ook saam met die verrichtinge na hierdie dienst, vader, dat die elke van ons sal sien, die voedsel wat ons sal inneem. Gaan so saam met ons, dat, as ons uit mekaar het sal gaan in die dag, dat die ons altyd in liefde na by sal hou. Geest ons blief vir ons daar die liefde vir jy altyd. Dat is altijd ons oog gevestigd zal op Jesus, ons leidsman en verlosser in Jesus naam. Amen.